Please open your Bible to Acts chapter number 8, where we're going to scroll back to verse number 12 so we can get our context reset again on this very important story. This story illustrates the apostolic ability to lay hands on people and those people receive the supernatural gifting of the Holy Spirit. That is distinct to them. I shared with you there is a handout on the website, into the word.net, uh, there in the PDF resources section, uh, that will help you see this information from not just this text, but other texts, that this is a distinction between what happens at one's salvation, when one calls upon the name of the Lord, when one repents of sin, when one is immersed in the name, one receives the the forgiveness of sin, but also the indwelling gift. That's all automatic. And there is no supernatural sign at the coming of the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. However, as we will see in this story, the apostles can lay hands on people who have already believed, and those people will then receive supernatural abilities by the direction of the Holy Spirit. And that is what gets the main attention of a former, um, a former scammer, a former grifter named Simon. And so here we go. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were immersed, both men and women. So those are the people at Samaria being saved under the ministry of Philip, the member of the seven, but also someone that's going to soon be referred to as Philip the Evangelist. Verse 13, even Shimon, or Simon, the the magician, he himself believed, and after being immersed, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. So he is really excited by what he's seeing in the life of Philip. But then, verse 14 says, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John. So two of the apostles, with what purpose? Verse 15, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been immersed in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they'd only been through conversion. They had not received at the hands of Philip supernatural abilities. Philip had them, but he could not pass them on. That is an apostolic prerogative, which is made very clear in what follows. Verse 17, then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And I shared with you when the Holy Spirit came on them in power, some of them probably spoke with unlearned languages. Others suddenly found that they could prophesy direct information from God to people. Others had the discernment of spirits, could uh, even cast out demons. Uh, some had uh, gifts of wisdom, uh, gifts of insight, uh, the ability to, um, to do miracles of all different types. And that's what Simon saw. It says, verse 18, now when Simon saw that the spirit, the supernatural gifting from the Holy Spirit, was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. I have to stress this. He didn't see this happen with Philip because Philip wasn't an apostle and didn't have this ability. But he did see it with Peter and John. And so when he saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And he probably had plenty of it because, remember, He's a scam artist. He's a grifter, saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So he wants to be able, like an apostle, to give supernatural abilities to people. I mean, that would be a pretty big deal for him. 
It would be the real deal for him. But Peter said back to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. So the point here is that uh, this belongs to the apostolic office. Uh, The language here in uh, verse number 21 is similar to what Peter says uh, at the time that they appointed Matthias as the replacement for Judas. There is a limited number of apostles, a very limited number of apostles, 12 actually, appointed by Jesus during his ministry. One of those betrayed and was replaced by Peter and the others uh, after the ascension. And then we have James, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, that is appointed by Jesus in some sort of private appearance to James, and he becomes the apostolic leader of the Jewish church at Jerusalem. And then soon we will be talking about Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles. He will be tapped by the resurrected Jesus to serve in a special function of leadership. And so here is Peter telling Simon, you don't have the right to that, and you need to repent, verse 22, uh, for this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So the apostles all have this wide-ranging supernatural gifts from the Holy Spirit, including the discernment of people's secret intentions. Remember the Ananias and Sapphira thing, where Peter knew that they were lying about giving 100% of the proceeds of the sale of their property, because the Holy Spirit had given him this insight. The Holy Spirit is giving him insight here that Simon is caught up in this self-centered desire to have power, to be able to perform in such a way that people will look to him, and uh, he can return, I guess, to his his grifting, but this time he will have the real deal. And so he's told that he needs to repent. And I shared with you, I think just very briefly, uh, maybe I didn't, uh, but uh, in the ancient church, uh, there was a term that arose called simony, and it was considered to be something extremely wicked. And that was to try to purchase for yourself the right to be a priest or the right to be a preacher in a certain place. Uh, And uh, the church made rules early on that that is wrong. Uh, The people who serve in places of leadership should match God's pattern for people in those leadership positions and also they should be there at God's will, not because they have a whole bunch of cash on hand. Uh, It is sad uh, that later in church history, an awful lot of simony went on. People bought archbishoprics, uh, and uh, uh, being able to even become pope because they had enough cash to secure Uh, those positions. Horribly inappropriate. And so here, Simon Shimon is told he needs to repent. Verse 24 says, he answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So in just those few words, it sounds as if he is repentant. But the traditions of the early church, uh, some of the Histories of the early church indicate that this guy did not truly repent, and he became a thorn in the side of the leadership because he continued his attempt to get back into a position of authority over people. And so let's pray against those that have this overwhelming desire to be in control 
of the church. And always remember that Jesus gave the model. He said that anyone that wants to be great in the church needs to be the servant of everyone else. We look for servant leaders. And uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 3, Titus uh, chapter number 1, have the God-given characteristics of good shepherds and also good servants or deacons and deaconesses for our churches. And so let's make sure we put the right people into those positions of responsibility and leadership. Verse number 25 finishes the story by saying, Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem. This is Peter and John. They finished their mission at this site. And they were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans on their way back to Jerusalem. And so the church has expanded from Jerusalem and Judea into Samaria now. And uh, you know, in uh, the Great Commission, Jesus said that it would start in Jerusalem and Judea and then into Samaria and from there into the remotest parts of the earth. And that is the next story, the beginning of that expansion. Verse 26, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise, go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. So after Peter and John leave, the, the angel of the Lord comes to uh, Philip in a dream or a vision and tells him it's time for him to move on as well, which is perfectly fine because guess what? Now that you've got people at Samaria that have had the apostles laid hands laid upon them, some of them have the supernatural gifts of prophecy and of wisdom, and therefore they can now lead the new growing church at Samaria. So Philip can be moved on to his next assignment, and that assignment takes him to the road that connects Judea to Gaza. Uh, and uh, this goes basically west out of Jerusalem, kind of zigzags down through the hills until it hits the, the uh, plain, the flat area. And then it turns south uh, west a little bit and goes down to Gaza. And then we're on a coastal road that goes all along the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea and goes down into Egypt itself. And from there, other Roman roads head south along the Nile until you go to the borders with Ethiopia, which is not under Roman control. And uh, that is the next target of the gospel. Uh, but Philip is not heading all the way to Ethiopia. No, this is what he's going to do. Verse 27, he rose and he went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Kandaki, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all his, her treasure. Now let's talk about Kandaki. Kandaki is not a name, it is a title. It means the queen mother. And in Ethiopia's history, Nubia is also another name for Ethiopia, which is immediately south of Egypt. Uh, this country has been led uh, by a, a partnership between a male king and a female queen or the mother of the next male king. Now, sometimes Kandaki, the queen mother, ends up being queen herself for a while as the next king is growing up. Uh, and some of these queens are quite interesting. Uh, one who lived uh, quite a few years before this story, back in the time of Augustus Caesar, she was, she was known as One-Eyed Kandiki, and uh, she was a warrior queen. And uh, she uh, lived in a time when 
uh, Egypt was kind of taken into the Roman Empire, and the Ethiopians were resisting the possibility of the Romans moving south along the Nile into their territory. And one of the things that One-Eyed Gandiki did to show that this was not going to happen is she had a special bust, a head statue of Augustus Caesar with apparently crystal eyes put underneath the steps of the Ethiopian temple to whatever god or goddess they were worshiping at the time so that she would be walking over the head of Augustus each time she went up to approach their god or goddess. And so that's the type of of office that we're talking about here uh, that this man works for. He is an official who takes care of all her finances. And we don't know if he's ethnically Jewish, because he could have been, because Jewish people were in communities all up and down the Nile, deep down into the south areas of Ethiopia itself. Um, But he also could be a convert, a proselyte. Uh, But this is what we do know for sure. The end of verse 27 says, he had come to Jerusalem to worship. So he had made this long trip through Egypt and then up to Jerusalem itself, perhaps to be there during maybe the sabbatical year that ran from the fall of 33 through the fall of 34, because this story is probably happening, uh, I believe, right around uh, 34 sometime. And so he may have uh, attended a full year of worship at Jerusalem. And now he's heading home. Verse 26, he was returning, sitting in his chariot, no doubt a very fancy chariot uh, with a uh, chauffeur that's driving it. And uh, he is uh, apparently sitting in a nice comfortable seat. Uh, He might even have a table that he can put things on, including a scroll that he might be reading. Because verse 28 goes on to say, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, scrolls had to be handwritten. And so it was very expensive to purchase something like this. Uh, I believe he had just recently purchased the scroll of Isaiah. And now as he is being driven home again, he's reading his way through it. And we know he's as far as what we call chapter 53, which means he's a long ways into this scroll. But it seems like Philip probably catches up with him a good long ways from Jerusalem. So the spirit now says to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So now Philip understands why he's on this specific road. So Philip ran to him. So you can picture Philip kind of jogging down the road, and he jogs up next to this fancy chariot. Uh, The chariot's not going at full tilt. Uh, It's going walking or trotting speed. And Philip is jogging alongside, and he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. It was common practice that when you uh, were attending to the Word of God, you read it out loud. This gave you multiple blessings. It allowed you to see the Word of God with your eyes, to feel it on your tongue and your lips, and to hear it with your own ears. And it also blessed the people that were around you that might be within earshot. Uh, This is a very important aspect, I think, to Bible study. Everyone, I would encourage you from time to time, you should read the Word of God out loud. Uh, when I was teaching school, I, I had my students, even on uh, their lessons, to touch the piece of paper, read from the piece of paper with their eyes, using their voice, and also hearing it with their own ears. Because the more of our senses we engage, the stronger the memory uh, assignment that occurs. 
I, I told my students, if I could even have you taste and smell it, I would, because then it would gauge all of you. So here is the eunuch reading aloud from the passage. Philip jogging next to the chariot. Here's what he's reading. And he asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said back to him, well, how can I unless someone guides me? Now that makes me suspect he may have been a proselyte, not somebody raised in Judaism where they hear the word of God read on a regular basis and taught about by the by the Pharisees, the rabbis. Uh, it seems like perhaps he was a full-blood Ethiopian who somehow came into contact with Judaism, converted to it, and is now trying to study it in more depth. So he says, how am I supposed to understand passages like this unless somebody guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, and it's Isaiah 53, starting at verse number 7. Now, remember, back in this time, there was no such thing as chapter and verse divisions. So he has scrolled his way through this scroll until he comes very close to the tail end to chapter 53. Here's the quote. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Now it goes on from there. This is called the suffering servant passage. And those of us that have been Christians for any decent period of time at all, we know that this passage is about Jesus. There are parts of it that are clearly about his crucifixion, clearly about his resurrection even, uh, and about his lordship and his mistreatment uh, when he came here uh, to planet Earth in human form. And so this is a passage about the Messiah, Jesus. But this guy doesn't understand that. The eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? So he wants to know, is Isaiah writing this about himself? Is, is he the one that is suffering here? Or is it about someone else? Uh, modern Jews, by the way, many of them say that this passage is about Israel as a people group. But we know like Philip knew, it's about Jesus. So verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Yahushua, he who is salvation, Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being immersed? Now, you know what that tells us? It tells us that Philip had a good long time to talk to this man, and he showed him all sorts of passages from the Old Testament that were about Jesus, but he also told the, the gospel story that Christ died for our sins according to these scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose bodily again on the third day according to these scriptures, and then he told them all about the eyewitness accounts that People saw this Jesus alive and how Jesus gave a great commission before ascending on high that everyone should repent and believe the gospel and be immersed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that they could move into the forgiveness of their sins and receive the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. So he had to have included all of those bits and pieces so that eventually the eunuch himself coming across a river goes, well, look, here's some water. What's stopping me from being immersed into the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Now, there is a verse that is not in our English Standard Version that you will see in other versions like King James, where it says, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, 
I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The reason it's missing from the English Standard Version is because it is not in the most ancient of the New Testament manuscripts. Don't let that bother you because the wording you'll find in the King James certainly represents ideals from elsewhere in the manuscripts. Uh, that, yes, you may be immersed if you believe. And you need to kind of verbalize that. You need to kind of say that outside. Uh, don't just let it be in your heart. You need to verbalize it. And so he commanded the chariot to stop. That's the eunuch. said, stop the chariot. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he immersed him. And then when they came up out of the water, that is, up out of this river, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. He just disappears. I don't know if uh, he just popped out of uh, sight or whether or not there was something more supernatural like happened at Elijah where we've got some fire involved, but he is gone. And then the eunuch saw him no more. And what does he do? He went on his way rejoicing. And the stories that are told are that he became the first evangelist of the gospel in his home country of Ethiopia. Here in the early 30s of the Christian era. Now, what happens to Philip? Well, that sets the stage for a later story. It says that Philip, after having you know, been taken away by the Holy Spirit, he found himself at Azotus, which is Old Testament Ashdod on the Mediterranean coast. And so as he passed through he preached the gospel to all the towns along that coast northward until he came to Caesarea. And it's at Caesarea that he settled down and raised a family and became known as Philip the Evangelist. Later, Luke will write about how Paul met Philip the Evangelist at Caesarea.